when I was a young man, I was a mind to go off to war, uh, to test myself in combat. And this was during the height of the Cold War, the height of the buildup in Vietnam, the Vietnam conflict. Um, <clears throat> so when I graduated from college, I went off and I volunteered for the Army. And because of some of my unique backgrounds, they offered a program to me. And I was selected with about 200 people from across the country for some specialized training. Uh, a normal um, inductee is going to be trained for about six months before they hit duty. Well, I was trained for six months, and half of the people that I trained with were out of the program. Then I was put in another program for six months. And at the conclusion of that time, about 200 people I started with were down to about 25. And we graduated as officers uh, in the United States Army, regular Army officers. We weren't in the re reserve, or we weren't in the guard, or we weren't ROTC trained. We just had come raw out of college and gone through this incredible training. And these are some of the finest and most noble young men that I had ever met. And I trained with them, and it kind of got bonded because we actually had people hurt and shot and lost people regularly in training. And at the conclusion, when I was about to be um, uh, commissioned as an infantry officer and ready to fight, I was commissioned instead into the military intelligence. And I became an intelligence officer. And I never, and then I went for another six months of training. And I was trained as an intelligence research analyst. I was trained in all kinds of other aspects of intelligence work. And at the conclusion of that training, I was assigned to something called the 902nd MI Group in Washington, D.C. And I was told by senior officers, Mr. You Got It Made, that's as far as you get in military intelligence, you're going to work in direct support of the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. That's what the 902nd did. So I went there as a very young man after a year and a half of the most arduous training and conditioning and teaching, uh, and I became a member of the security team for the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence, and I began to travel worldwide two days here, a week over there, sometimes two months, and from place to place to place. I had top, uh, top secret uh, clearance, but I also had all these what they call category clearances, because as a consequence of my job, I was going to be exposed to what amounted to state secrets and intelligence programs that nobody was supposed to know about. When I traveled in country, nobody knew I was there, not even my own military not even my own diplomatic corps. I had false identification and I traveled as a civilian. And every place I went, I was exposed to very high level intelligence information about the war in Vietnam and about other areas because I was on the border in West Germany. I was in Ethiopia with rebels running around in the hills and I was in Thailand, up country in the jungle where we weren't supposed to be. And I was in Vietnam a number of times, short times, and I had to do a job there. The last time I came back from Vietnam, um, I had been out in the field, and I had learned a lot about intelligence as opposed to what governments tell the people. And when I came back, I had learned that my government was lying regularly about what it was doing, about incidents it was in, about who were our friends and who were our enemies, and I also learned that everybody else was lying too. We were lying, the Israelis were lying, the Egyptians were lying, the Soviet Union was lying, the Chinese were lying, and both sides of the war in Vietnam were lying. You see? But those noble young men that I served with, they were dying. About a year later, a huge percentage of them, some people said about half of them, and I sat at a table one night with other agents that I met in Saigon, you know, by accident, what about this man? Well, I'm sorry. And what about that man? And they'd look the other way. And what about this? And they say, well, he's lost some part of himself. So when I came back, and in addition to which, by that time, I had been exposed to danger. I had been in very unusual situations. And I actually had the blood of my fellow soldiers sprinkled at my feet. And I came back from Vietnam traumatized, you'd say, post-traumatic stress. But nobody told about those things in those days. You came back from Vietnam, nobody wanted to know what you did in the war. They didn't want to hear about it. So I came back, and I came back to the 902nd, to Washington, D.C., kind of a disaffected soul, but not quite aware of that yet. 
And I got back, and I already was in an advantageous position. I was working for the security team for the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. I was back a month or so, we debriefed, and I was called into my commanding officers, um, called into him in the morning, and they said, David, we have a different task for you now. Tomorrow morning, we want you to show up in the Pentagon at 5 o'clock in the morning, and here's where you're supposed to be. Tomorrow morning, you're going to work directly for the Assistant, Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. They called him the AXI. Uh, you know, Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. And I was going to now be on a special operational team that he was going to govern and run himself. So 5 o'clock the next morning, I was in the Pentagon, and I found my way to the security area, and I was let in and marked off a list, and we went down this passageway, down and down and down, and it was like a narrow passageway, and it went down in a slope and curved. Maybe two people could walk together. And I noticed some other people were coming in with me. We were all dressed as civilians, we were all younger, and it was obvious we were all military intelligence agents of one sort or another, and nobody knew each other. And we went down into the bowels of the Pentagon, into this secure area, which amounted to um, um, a lecture hall. But it was for presentations, and there were monitors up on the wall and a lectern up there, and these young men filed in the room, and I realized I didn't know any of them about 30 of them, except that one young man way over there. And I'd look at him, and he'd look at me, and I was pretty sure I saw him in the halls of the 902nd. You see, I knew him, but nobody in the 902nd knew. I, I was locked in a secure area when I was at the 902nd with five other people. We didn't know what anybody else did, and they didn't know what we did, but I'd seen that man. So I was in there, and this is like 6 o'clock, 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning, and the first sergeant comes in, and he calms everybody down, and he says, okay, Sergeant Major, this general, the Axis Sergeant Major, and that's like his, his personal attache, is going to come in and address you all, you gentlemen here, before the Axie comes, and then he'll talk to you and tell you what this mission is. So he came in, the Sergeant Major, and he was just covered with braids and medals and ribbons, and he was dressed in a uniform. And Sergeant Majors are kind of unique people. They hold a unique position. So the Sergeant Major came in, and he began to give us a pep rally. Now, I had been around. I was a seasoned Asian. I didn't need pep rallies. I didn't know what they wanted me to do. And he was telling me what a patriot this general was and how he had the ability to change things. He had the ability to make a difference and that we, working with him, we could make a difference in this war that we were fighting against communism and the peace activist movement in the United States of America. And this general was a great American patriot. And he shortly thereafter came in. Now, he was not wearing a uniform. What he was wearing was like little bikini glasses. They used to have them back in the 60s, about this big. And he was wearing them. And if you ever saw George C. Scott and Dr. Strangelove, where he had the cigar. So it's like 6.30 in the morning. And this man walks in. He's got a cigar flapping in his mouth, lit you see, in bikini glasses, and he goes, launches himself into the description of what we're going to do. And fortunately, he took the cigar down and put it out, because you know, I was up close and it was bothering me. And, uh, and the whole thing was very strange. I knew it was something very strange going on. I didn't need to be cheerled. I didn't need to really build up my patriotism, okay? So he begins to describe this mission that we're about to embark on. It was illegal both according to the law of the land and according to martial law, military law. It was unconstitutional. It amounted to treason. And I knew that. And I sat there. Now, this is a career opportunity. I had this incredible opportunity. In, in a couple years' time, most men work, and I was told this, most men work their entire life in military intelligence to get where you're starting, David. You're working, you're now working with the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. And he was asking me to do treason against the people of the United States of America. What it amounts to, we were gonna go out and do the crime, and they were, we were gonna arrest peace activists, and they were gonna serve the time. We did the crime, they would serve the time. It was a black operation, and it was treasonous, and I didn't like it. And I sat there, and I kinda, okay, okay. But in the middle of that, I realized I wasn't doing this. All I had to do was say yes and participate, but I wasn't going to do this. This was wrong, and I knew it, and I also you know, knew quite a few other things were not right. So 
uh, the, the Axie, this general, gave his presentation and told what we were going to do. And we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock, gentlemen. I'll see you then. Goodbye. You're dismissed. So everybody kind of filed out of the room. Lights went on. And I remember that guy over there. And as we filed out to that passageway that went up and out of the security area, that man over there kept inching his way towards me. And I realized he did recognize me. And we went into that little doorway, passageway, to go up out of this area together, side by side. And we walked for a little bit until we were kind of clear of other people. And we kind of already knew he was looking at me and I was looking at him. And one of us said, what do you think? And the other one said, no way. We're not going to participate in this. This is not right. So by the time we got to the top of that stairwell, or that, excuse me, uh, passageway, um, we had agreed that we were going to go immediately back to our commanding officer and tell him we don't want anything to do with it, which is exactly what we both did. We went back to the commanding officer, the 902nd MI group, and I realized when I walked in there, I was going to tell him I don't want to work for the Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence. I was going to make a choice. I was going to sacrifice an opportunity, a career. And I had really signed on to be a career officer. And I really had it made. I was already working at the top levels. And they told me, you'll keep coming back, Dave. You see, and I had state secrets in my head and all kinds of specialized training. But I wasn't going to do that. So I made a choice to miss an opportunity. And that's exactly what happened to me. Okay, it kind of my career faded very quickly, and I wanted it to. I got out of the military about four months later. I didn't want it anymore, although they kind of made me an officer, and they wanted to send me to another intelligence, yada, yada. No, sir, I don't want it. And when I got out, I resigned my regular Army commission. I didn't want that opportunity. I chose not to have that opportunity. You're going to have opportunities come to you, and some of you are going to miss because of circumstance. It rains on your parade, and so you don't have a parade. And some of them you're going to say, well, I could do that, but I'd rather do this. You'll make a choice. And sometimes those missed opportunities, are going to, you're going to look at something and say, I don't want that opportunity in my life anymore. And you're going to say no to an opportunity, so you're going to make a decision. And that was my missed opportunity. I missed a career in military intelligence, but I really do think I made the right decision. And it never, I never turned back on that, and it never looked anything different than the right decision to miss that opportunity. Thank you.